sometimes history becomes forgotten history because somebody powerful doesn't want it to be remembered. Events are kept secret, are suppressed, are held from the historical record. And we don't really know how many important historical events might have been lost that way, but we know that sometimes there are historical events that governments and powerful people try to keep secret, but they still manage to get out. And one of those was an accident with a reactor on a Soviet nuclear submarine in 1961 that the Soviet Union very much did not want anybody in the world to know about, but the details of which eventually did come out. They came out because, frankly, it is history that deserves to be remembered. In 1957, the Soviet Union started producing its first nuclear-powered attack submarine under the title Project 627 and the NATO designation November Class. While the class demonstrated the extraordinary endurance of nuclear-powered submarines, being the first Soviet submarines to travel under the North Pole, it also demonstrated their complexity. It was a troubled class of submarine, with 131 Soviet sailors dying from various fires, reactor leaks, and accidents during the class's service, including the loss of submarine K-8, the first Soviet loss of a nuclear submarine. In 1958, the Soviets started producing a diesel-electric-powered ballistic missile submarine under the title Project 629 and the NATO designation Gulf Class. One submarine of that class, the K-129, was lost in 1968 when, for unknown reasons, it exceeded its crush depth. Parts of that submarine were later recovered by the United States in a then-secret project called Project Azorian. In 1959, the Soviets started producing a class of nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines that married the November-class design to the missile compartment of the Gulf class. Called Project 658, eight of these submarines were built and classified by NATO as the Hotel class. This was the first generation of Soviet nuclear submarines equipped with nuclear ballistic missiles. Initially, three R-13 submarine-launched short-range ballistic missiles. The class was rushed into production because Soviet leadership were desperate to build a nuclear submarine fleet that could match that of the United States. It was so rushed, in fact, that some Soviet naval officers thought that the class was not fit for service. The first of the hotel class to be built was the Soviet submarine K-19. Constructed over a period of just over six months, between October of 1958 and April of 1959, the rush to construct the submarine showed in the fact that nine workers died in different accidents during the vessel's construction. Launched on April 8, 1959, the submarine had a bad start. Breaking with naval tradition, the Soviets had a man, rather than a woman, move to christen the submarine. As it slid down into the ocean and he hit it with a bottle of champagne, the bottle refused to break, instead bouncing off of the submarine's rubber skin. According to Mariner tradition, that is a sign of ill omen. The boat had problems quickly. In January 1960, before it even started sea trials, confusion during a shift change resulted in an improper operation of a reactor. Bending a reactor rod and required the entire reactor be dismantled for repairs. Problems continued as the boat suffered a number of early issues during sea trials. Most notable among those was a pressure dive test in which the reactor compartment started to flood, requiring the captain to order the main ballast tanks blown in order to emergency surface. The boat took on so much water that it lost stability, surfacing on its port side and nearly colliding with a support vessel. Investigations found that the leak was the result of a faulty gasket that should have been replaced during construction. Other accidents were troubling, but less serious. After a high-speed trial, the crew found out that the boat's rubberized coating had all peeled off, and the entire boat had to be repainted. But despite these issues, the K-19 was among the newest and most modern boats in the Soviet Navy. Its captain, Captain Second Rank Nikolai Zadiev, was a talented and veteran submariner who had been personally promoted by Defense Minister Marshall Georgi Zhukov. The 139-man crew of the K-19 were veterans of the submarine service, albeit their experience was with diesel-powered boats. The K-19 was considered the pride of the Soviet fleet, its most cutting-edge vessel, and service aboard the boat was a matter of distinction, with the crew, for example, getting the best rations in the fleet. Although Zadiev questioned the quality of the boat and its construction, there was no reason to believe that it could not successfully perform its first mission in June of 1961 to participate in a month-long war game. The K-19 began its mission on June 18th. The submarine had to enter the Atlantic without being discovered by NATO and then to await orders. At first, the mission went fine. On June 30th, the crew celebrated Captain Zadiev's 35th birthday with a double ration of homemade ice cream and wine. The boat was positioned south of Greenland and had just been given orders to start to proceed north under the sea ice. 
In the early morning hours of July 4th, 1961, Lieutenant Yuri Postyev, who was the officer in charge of propulsion, noticed that the pressure gauge for the coolant system for the starboard reactor was vibrating. As he watched, the gauge dropped to zero. The coolant system for the reactor had failed. Apparently a pipe had burst and the resulting loss in pressure had disabled both pumps. At 4.15 a.m., he issued an urgent call to the captain. The nuclear core was designed to flow coolant continuously over the uranium fuel rods. That then removes the heat generated by fission, where it is transferred to the turbine that turns the screws, giving the ship propulsion. Without coolant, the core can quickly overheat. The system automatically shut down, a process called scram, but the reactor continued to overheat, the result of what is called decay heat from fission products that remain after reactor scram. The K-19 was now without power, 300 feet below the ocean. The temperature in the reactor room soared past 140 degrees Celsius, 284 degrees Fahrenheit, as high as their gauge went, enough to ignite a fire. Inside the reactor, the temperature rose to 800 degrees Celsius, nearly 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. The potential consequences were disastrous. Without cooling, the reactor would eventually melt or have a thermal explosion, either of which would not only mean the loss of the ship and crew, but would cause a massive environmental disaster as the nuclear material from the boat's two reactors and three nuclear missiles were released into the sea. Just as pressing, at the height of the Cold War, an unexplained explosion or meltdown could have been misinterpreted as an attack by either side, resulting in nuclear war. Typically, a nuclear reactor would have a backup cooling system. Engineers and Captain Zadiev himself had argued that such a redundant system was necessary. But they had been told that the reactor was complex enough already. Around 6 a.m., Captain Zadiev ordered the crew to blow the ballast to surface the boat, planning to radio for assistance. On the surface, they found out that the long-range radio transmission antennas were not functioning. Zadiev could not contact Moscow. Lieutenant Yuri Filin, just 23 years old, was the officer in charge of the operation of the reactors. He proposed a radical solution. The ship's engineers would jury-rig a coolant system using the ship's drinking water system by cutting one of the reactor's valves and connecting it to a pipe supplying water. But this solution included a terrible problem. All the work would have to be done in the reactor room, which was now contaminated with lethal amounts of radiation. Giving that order would mean ordering young men to their deaths. The order weighed heavily on the captain, who later said, at one point I considered going down to my cabin, taking out my pistol, and finishing my problems all at once. The members of the engineering crew were organized into three-man teams. Each would only work for 10 minutes at a time and attempt to limit their radiation exposure. They had no appropriate protective gear. They would use only raincoats and gas masks. One of the volunteers was Lieutenant Boris Korcholov, described as a blue-eyed ladies' man. Captain Zadiev accompanied him to the reactor room. He never faltered. None of them did, although they knew they were likely headed towards their deaths. When Korcholov stumbled out of the reactor room, he pulled off his gas mask and vomited. The repair took hours and then sprung a leak, requiring more time in the compartment. The system worked well enough to bring the reactor temperatures down, but the eight men from the engineering section had received more than three times the lethal dose of radiation. Their faces were swollen and red. They started to sweat blood. Moreover, radioactive steam had made it to the submarine's ventilation system. The entire boat was contaminated. Every crewman had been exposed to dangerous levels of radiation. The K-19 was able to use its short-range transmitter to contact another Soviet submarine, the S-270, a diesel-electric patrol submarine of the NATO designation Whiskey class, which arrived alongside them 13 hours after the cooling system failed. Due to the radiation, the crew was removed to the S-270. The eight members of the engineering crew were so exposed that even after their clothes were destroyed, they still measured radiation above background. That is to say, the sailors themselves had become radioactive. The K-19 was towed to the port of Polyarni. The boat was so contaminated that it contaminated the port for some 700 meters around where it was docked. The most seriously sick were quickly evacuated to hospitals. Lieutenant Korcholov, the blue-eyed ladies' man, was among the first to die, along with two others on July 10th. Their comrades described them as being awake and in extreme pain, almost unrecognizable. They could not talk, but they could whisper, and when they did, they begged their crewmates to end their suffering. By July 25th, all eight members of the engineering team had died from radiation exposure. 
Their bodies were so contaminated that they were buried in a communal, unmarked grave. Their families were not told of the burial, nor how they died. Fourteen other members of the K-19 crew died in the next two years of radiation exposure. The 22 members of K-19's crew who died are most certainly heroes who gave their lives to save the lives of others. Although the accident was kept secret, Soviet doctors established a protocol, a grueling protocol, that included blood transfusions and bone marrow transplants that extended the lives of the rest of the crew, even though some of them had been exposed to what was thought to be lethal doses of radiation. Investigations after posited two possible explanations for what caused the pipe to burst. In one, a welder might have neglected to use a thermal blanket when they were welding another part, and sparks from the welding might have landed on the pipes, causing microabrasions, which eventually caused the pipe to fail. In another, there might have been a test where uh, the wrong pressure gauge was used, and the pipes were exposed to twice the amount of pressure that they were supposed to be. That should have resulted in all the pipes being replaced, but the mistake was apparently never reported to superiors. Either explanation underlies the fact that it was the rush to build the submarine that was the ultimate cause of the accident aboard K-19. The entire reactor section of the submarine was removed and dumped at sea. K-19 was returned to service in 1963. It continued to suffer from accidents and breakdowns. In 1972, 30 crew members died in a fire aboard the vessel. It was decommissioned in 1990. In 2002, a Hollywood film was made uh, depicting the reactor accident aboard the K-19, starring Harrison Ford and Liam Neeson. Members of the crew of the K-19, however, said that the depiction of the officers and their actions was inaccurate. The film gave the submarine the nickname The Widowmaker, but that nickname was actually never used by the Soviet Navy. Sailors who sailed aboard the K-19 instead gave it another nickname. They called it the Hiroshima. Twenty-six members of the crew were given awards for gallantry for actions during the accident, according to Captain Zadiev, mostly to keep them quiet. They were instructed never to speak about the accident, which was held as a closely guarded secret by the Soviets, clear until 1991. It was only the memories of the surviving crew that kept the reactor accident aboard K-19 from becoming forgotten history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.